Let's take a look at making a custom BGA or silage clamp, whatever you want to call it. I'm going to, let's go with a silage clamp. I don't want to create an entire BGA, um, <laughs> at least not in this video. Uh, I've got some textures that I'm going to work with here, just pretty straightforward, basic. Now, what I would probably recommend is to find a map, any map, doesn't matter what map it is, um, and have a look on the map itself to judge the kind of size that you want to make your solids clamp. Uh, so if, let's just say, for example, I go into Felsbrunn. It doesn't really matter. Like I say, any map will do uh, to a degree. You want to get a kind of idea of the area that you would potentially want to put a solids clamp into. And I think this is a better way of actually judging the size or the area that you've got to work with. Um, there are, you know, um, for me at least, issues with scaling things in um, Blender. So what I'm going to do is actually have a look in Bellsbrun here and just, like I said, let's get my nav speed up a little bit. If you actually use a map as your basis to get an idea of the kind of space that you want to create your your area or whatever else um <clears throat> i think then you can understand a little bit easier um the scaling that you need to sort of set so kind of like find an area uh relatively sort of levelish area i would recommend um and then try and kind of work around that as best you can with the buildings and structures and other things like that around it to, like I say, give you an idea of the scaling that you're going to want to use. So the way that I do this is to actually import a primitive object or get a primitive object. So I'm just going to create a cube here. And I'm going to control B and interactive placement. And then what I want to do is kind of lift, lift it up off the terrain a little bit and then scale it out. So I'm just going to sort of bring it out to maybe somewhere like that. Um, and then maybe something like that. And this will give you a better idea, um, in my opinion, of how to kind of get a better look at how things compare to other structures in a map. Uh, now, obviously, you could take structures and things like that, export them out of a map, import them into Blender, and then use it that way. But I find that doing it that way, you just end up with a lot of cluttered stuff in Blender that just generally gets in the way. Um, now, obviously, you can put it on different uh, layers and whatever else, but and then just you know select the layers that you need to have displayed. But <clears throat> again, if you're not too familiar with Blender, that can be more complicated than it's worth. So for me, this is a much easier way of doing it. So I'm just going to dra drag this up and scale it up a little bit. Um, now, what you want to do is kind of look at again, compare it to buildings and things like that and get a rough idea of the kind of size that you want the solid clamp to be. So this for me is going to be far too big. So my scale X, which is going to be my red arrow, um, I'm going to maybe put that to, let's say, um, 25, something like that, maybe. And then this one here, I want to be about 5.5. And then this one, uh, let's see, don't want it to be quite that wide, maybe, so which is the blue. So let's sort of um, maybe go down to 14, 15, 16, something like that. Maybe something like that would probably do quite well. Um, and that will give you perhaps maybe a better understanding, a better idea of how to set up your scaling because I can compare that to buildings around it um, and, you know, work with that to get what I want. So, you know, I mean, you could either even in this particular case on this map, bring it over to where the BGA is, like so, and then get, get a bit of a understanding of the width and height of the BGA here uh, to give you kind of like a, a visual representation of what you want to scale it all to. But I'm going to say that's probably about right, actually. That's not too far off. Got a fairly good kind of height on the walls here. Um, 
and the width I think is probably going to be adequate to get in and out of whatever else. Uh, now if you've obviously got a particular position that you want to put this in on a map, then again this is a very good way of doing it. You can create your primitive in an area that you've set up for a solid clamp to be placed, and then again you can scale the primitive cube here to fit exactly in that space, and then just take your attributes here and put them directly into Blender. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up Blender and then take those readings and basically just put them into here. So uh, what I'm going to do first of all, I'm going to select everything and delete it because I don't want the lamp and the camera in here at the moment because they just get in the way. So I'm going to bring in um, or create a primitive cube like so. I think the ice cream van is just coming out around the road. So I apologize for the noise. Um, and then what we want to do is just basically work with these. So scale X is going to be the same in Blender as it is in uh, Giant's Editor. So we want to put this in our dimensions, not the scale. We want to put this in our dimensions. So scale X we'll do like so. <clears throat> and then the scale Y. Is going to be different um, the way that things work within um, Blender and Giant Senator are a little bit weird. Uh, y is up and down, whereas in Blender, whereas or your height, vertical height, whereas in um, Giant Senator it's actually not. So just be a bit careful with that. Then we want the Z axis. We're going to put that in the Y dimensions in Blender, like so. And we then have a basis of our solids clamp, what sort of size we're going to be working with. So once we've done that, we'll close down the giant circuit here. We don't need that open anymore. I can close that down. Um, and then what I'm going to do is I want to basically have this at a zero point, but I need to set my origin in the correct position because at the moment, the origin is sort of in the middle of the cube. And I need the origin to be at the bottom of the cube. And this is really important when you're working with placeables. Um, in my opinion, it uh, uses this origin here to get the correct height for where placeables will be you know, put into the map and things like that. Uh, now, obviously, when you're um, working with the XMLs and whatever else, you can specify the height. So, um, But the problem is that if it's um, a zero height, <clears throat> and it's not at the bottom, it's in the middle, it can then sometimes get a bit confusing for the system, in my again, in my opinion, and it will then bury it in the ground, um, and you'll have to do a lot of adjustments. So it's better to just set your origin in Blender um, before you start to get to have to reset and freeze, freeze transformations in GE and things like that, because that's a lot more complicated in GE. Um, so... <clears throat> What I want to do is have this level with the grid, the bottom of this cube here with the grid. Uh, first of all, before I do that, what I'm going to do is set the actual scaling because we've actually applied some scaling because I've changed the dimensions. It scaled it up on the XYZ to create this. So I'm going to go control A and then lock my rotation and scale. Now, in this particular case, my scale, my rotation is actually already set at zero. But it's a habit that I've got into because when you export something from Giant's Editor and then bring it into Blender as an OBJ, um, I think because of the differences with the XYZ settings, um, it automatically applies an X rotation of 90 degrees. Um, and that can then, if you don't reset that to zero, when you export it out again as an I3D, <clears throat> it will then put the gizmo upside down um, and that can then cause further problems. So it's just a habit that I've got into to lock the or apply the, the rotation and scale irregardless. So now I do that, you can see my scaling has gone back to 1, 1 and 1. Um, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into uh, edit mode by pressing tab. You can also do that down here, switch between the different modes. Um, I'm going to press A to deselect everything. I'm going to go to face select mode. I'm going to select this bottom face. I'm going to go shift S and I'm then going to 
snap the cursor to selected and you'll see the little circle thing there the cursor has gone to this center of this face i'm going to tab back into object mode and press t to bring up this menu here and i'm going to go set origin to 3d cursor and that will then put it at the bottom and you can see it shifted on the z-axis by minus 2.75 so now what i can do is actually change that back to zero and it will now put it up in alignment with the grid and the origin will be at the bottom um, not in the center of the cube and again that will help when it comes to the placeable system because it's going to use this origin here to find its place on the terrain so i think that's a little bit um, makes things a little bit easier again in my opinion so now that we've actually got to that part i'm going to basically remove some faces here and then create my setup for the actual uh, bga clamp here so, or, or silage clamp i should call it a silage clamp really because it's just going to be a separate silage clamp it has nothing to do with the bga you can put it wherever you want theoretically on the map um, and then just create your silage <clears throat> for other purposes um, not just for using in the bga so i'm going to tab back into um, edit mode so press the tab key on your keyboard and that will then put you back into edit mode and I'm going to deselect everything I want to select this top face this bottom face uh, sorry this front face and this bottom face here and I'm going to then go X and delete faces you can also press the delete key which will bring up exactly the same menu but I just find X is easier because it's where my left hand sort of sits on the keyboard uh, and then we're going to delete those faces like so tab back into object mode you can see my origin is still set where I want it to be because it's been set to the cursor and not a specific area uh, if you remember when I set the actual I set it to the cursor not the geometry so it's not relevant to anything there um, <clears throat> I'm going to set the cursor back to the center though uh, so I just press shift s um, and then just put cursor to center so it keeps everything where it needs to be um, because this is what where things will spawn in if that cursor wherever that cursor is when you create a new object it will spawn there so if i click over here and then go shift a and create a plane it will come in over here we don't want that so we want the cursor to be in the center because it just makes things a little bit easier to move around if it's always been um, created somewhere in the center now there are you know obviously reasons why you would want it to be other other places but for something as basic as this just keep it in the center uh, just keeps everything centralized around what you're creating so what I want to do here then is actually make this solid so I want to give it a bit more geometry um, so what I'm going to do is use a modifier here the modifiers can only be applied in object mode so make sure you're in object mode and go over to the wrench here or spanner or whatever you want to call it and then in the drop down I'm just going to choose solidify you can see now it's created more geometry um, on the inside of the face so let's just say for example I wanted to solidify it the opposite direction what I would do here is go into edit mode select all of the faces and then control N and then choose the inside or outside well it depends because it think it only just gives you inside but to flip the faces around just if it doesn't do it automatically you might need to tick this box and now my faces have been switched so they're solid on the inside and not on the outside uh, one thing i need to actually point out which i should have done at the beginning here make sure that you have back face culling ticked uh, this is uh, quite important when it comes to um anything to do with giants editor and farm sim uh, because in blender if you don't have that ticked it will actually look like it's got a face where it actually hasn't got one so this is very important to keep this ticked and use gl sl as your um, material mode uh, so now that i've switched those around i can go back into object mode you can see the faces are on the inside and if i then solidify it it'll actually solidify it outwards not inwards so this is quite handy to be able to do this it's always going to put the solidified side to the um, outside or inside depending on which way your faces are pointing if that makes sense or your normals i should say your because you can you're flipping the normal basically that's what that does 
Um, so in this particular case, I want it to solidify outwards because this is the kind of size that I want to have the inside of the um, clamp here. But if you wanted to do it the other way, then that's perfectly fine. Uh, and then you just need to kind of judge how much you want to solidify it by. So in the thickness here, just basically drag this up. So you click in there and drag, and it will then basically create the the extra geometry and give it its thickness. So I generally want to go, let's say, um, well, it depends really, again, what you want to get out of it, I guess. So let's do, that might be a bit too thick. So I'm going to go um, 0.5. I think that's probably good enough for this. That's more than enough thickness there on that. Uh, the other thing you want to make sure is apply or tick the even thickness. The reason why you want to do that is because this, these two sides here, this one and this one, are th longer than the back face or the back part of the object. And if you don't click this box, the even thickness box, these ones will be given more thickness than the one at the back. Uh, it may not show up very well here, but if I tick this, you can see it's now giving everything an even thickness, whereas before it's parts of it won't have the same thickness as other parts because of the uh, difference in height and length of them. So just be a bit careful with that because now when I go even thickness, it's actually going to apply more thickness than I probably want. So you can see it's given it a little bit more. So with that ticked, I probably would then drag this down again to maybe something like, <clears throat> let's say uh, 0.35 something like that, just to bring it back to a relatively decent sort of thickness, but not overpowering. Uh, no, you know, everybody's um, designs are going to be different. You might want it to have a really fat sort of look to it, really deep walls or whatever else. This is a very basic setup. This is just to kind of give you an idea of how to do it and then what needs to be done to set all the triggers up or whatever else. Uh, you can make something much more um detailed than I can here so just in this uh, particular tutorial here so um now that we've actually got what we want there I'm going to go and click apply um again with modifiers it's very easy to forget you start going around and adding different geometry here than everywhere else creating further shapes and um you know modeling and then joining everything together and whatever else and you've forgotten it's got a modifier on it and then it all breaks um, and uh, doesn't work properly. So just be a little bit careful with modifiers. Um, finish what you're doing <clears throat> with the part that you're applying the modifier to. And then once you're happy with it, apply it. And now you can continue and make other things and change different things uh, without it causing any problems. Because if I don't apply the modifier, and then I start putting loop cuts in here and everywhere else. It's not going to have, it won't have actually physically created the extra geometry. So if I wanted to split this in half, for example, which I am actually going to do in a minute, uh, just to show you a different, another modifier and how useful it can be. If I don't apply the modifier and I do like a loop cut, for example, it'll only cut the loop into the face that's actually already been created. Because until you apply it, the extra geometry isn't really physically there yet. It's just showing you what will be done once you click apply. Um, so again, just be a little bit careful with that and complete what you're doing and then with the uh, with the actual modifier and then apply it before you start to move on and make further changes. So what I want to do then is in this particular case, because I want to give it a bevel on certain edges. Now I would like a bit of, uh, um, uh, what's the word? Um, symmetry I guess so I want both sides to have the same level of beveling in certain areas and that can be a little bit tricky to actually do if I bevel one edge here um, I'm not going to get exactly the same kind of bevel on this side now you know nothing in real life is exact <laughs> you know nothing is uh, going to be exact but um, this again can help when you're creating models um, for the topology and when you actually do like the unwrap and things like that if there is no sy symmetry between certain parts 
it has to then create a whole new um, sort of, you know, um, unwrap for the extra parts that you're adding in, which then can complicate stuff when you start to texture stuff. And that's what you have to really think about how the actual geometry and the topology of it is all going to be laid out um, when you start to come down to texturing things, because if this side and this side don't uh, have a kind of sy symmetry to it, it will look different on both sides. And again, you know, you could argue the fact that there is nothing exact, but in real life, but it is just easier when you're modeling, um, you know, forget real life for a little bit and then kind of, you know, work with how 3D modeling needs to be kind of set up to make things work the way they're meant to work. It's a bit of a, yeah, one of those. Uh, so what I'm going to do is select the object again, again here, and then I'm going to go into edit mode, press A to deselect everything. I'm going to go control R and put a loop cut. Um, now the loop cut is a loop and slide. If I actually show you over here, uh, you have this loop cut and slide. But I just use control R as the shortcut key. So basically if I do this, I can move around and you have to put it against an edge. So if I put it against this edge, it's going to cut it that way. If I put it against this edge, it's going to cut it that way, and so on and so on. Um, and once I've got the actual like pinky purple line around there, I can then left click and drag that, which is why it's called loop cut and slide. And I can then position it where I want to actually perform that loop cut. But what I want to do is put it right in the middle. So in this particular case, I go right click and then it will position it dead in the center. Um, and if I then, for example, put another loop cut in here and then right click, oops, sorry, left click and then right click, it will put it in the center between this edge and this edge. Um, but because of the way I've done the solidify, obviously it's not straight on the edges, so it's going to give me a bit of a weird loop cut. Uh, but I don't need that one anyway. The only thing I wanted to do here was basically um, put the cut in there so that I can delete half of this and then mirror the other half. And that's what the modifier I'm going to use shortly. So I'm going to press 7 on my numpad here which will give me top view. Um, and then what I want to do is, uh, let's just actually think about this. Uh, what I want to do, let's go back into object mode. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go R and then Z, and I'm going to rotate this by minus 90, like so. And then I'm going to left click, so it puts it in the right axis, like so. Or at least I think it should be right. I'm hoping it is. Um, we'll go with that anyway, and if I'm wrong, <laughs> I'm wrong, but I think that should be the way it, it's set up. Uh, and then because I've rotated it now, I'm going to need to reset the rotation again. So <clears throat> I'm going to go control A and lock my rotation. So it puts it back to zero or apply the rotation like so. Always really important to do that when you're working with modifiers. Again, it's just things that will start breaking if, uh, not a hundred percent um so what i want to do here then is go back into edit mode and i'm going to go press a a couple of times make sure everything's deselected i'm going to go b box selection um actually before i do that i'm going to go face select then i'm going to go b box selection and i'm going to drag across here to highlight all of these faces uh, now the one thing to note again here which is why i've done it this way is when you do this and i'm going to show you it's only going to select the visible faces. So if I go down here, the only ones that are selected are the top ones. But I want to get rid of everything. So what I need to do is I'm going to press A a couple of times to deselect everything. I'm going to press Z to go into wireframe mode. Then I'm going to go B for box select and drag. Now when I do this, if I press Z to come out of wireframe mode, it's selected everything, which is a much cleaner way of doing things. So now I'm going to go X and I'm going to delete the faces. You can see now we've only got one side to work with, which is the what, which is what I wanted because now anything I make a change to this side, once I apply the mirror modifier, it will then mirror it over here. So I don't need to do it. I can cut down on the amount of work that I need to do and it will just be mirrored <clears throat> wherever I choose to set the um, mirror up on the axes. And this again comes back to where you put your origin. Um, and it's very important to have that 
always in the right place depending on what you're trying to achieve because now when I mirror this basically what it's going to do is going to mirror it across either the x y or z axis so if that's in the wrong place you'll end up with your mirror all the way over here or over here or wherever else but I want to mirror it across the axes in the x direction so what I'm going to do is again in the modifiers tab here add modifier and come to mirror and you can see it's defaulted to x which gives me this result which is exactly what I wanted but if I wanted to mirror it on the y I would deselect x and select y and it will put it over there instead um, and then I could also do z but that would be um, not relevant in this particular case uh, so I'm going to go x because I want to have this kind of a setup now you can mirror um, things against other objects so there are times when you might need to create a separate object or an empty or something like that and then mirror it across a specific um, object but in this particular case I can just use the origin to do that for me um, which is much easier so that's all good uh, so now I've got this I don't want to apply this just yet because once I apply it it's then going to create this geometry and I'll be back to where I was before so in this particular case what I want to do is leave it in this state where it's kind of showing me what the end result will be uh, but then I want to continue making some changes and then that will show on the mirror and once I've completed all my changes I can apply it and then it will create the extra geometry with those changes in because at the at the moment the only one that's actually physically there is the one on this side if I go into um, edit mode you can see this is the one with faces and this one here is kind of just a render or a, a, um, a non-physical object at the moment so it's just the engine creating this for me the blender engine creating this for me to show me what the end result would be in a fashion so uh, in this particular case what I want to do is again give this a little bit of a bevel just so it has a bit of kind of um, I don't know a bit of flair to it I guess I mean that's probably the wrong word but just something other than basic just you know flat sides or whatever else so I'm going to go into edge select mode and then I'm going to select this edge here and if I actually I won't be able to do that very well but because uh, I need to be able to see what's going on here but I'll show you what I mean at the moment you can see both of these are completely flat at the moment so I'm going to just change this one I'm going to go control B and I'm going to drag out which will then give it a flat edge like that but if I then scroll up or down on my mouse wheel in this case I'm going to scroll up because I'm starting at one segment so I'm going to go up to about 10 and if you look in the menu down the bottom here you can see where it says segments um, and that basically will um, show you what how many segments you're cutting into your bevel so if we go to about maybe somewhere like that I'm going to go up to about 10 which is going to give me a fairly good result I think something like that and I'm going to left click and that's what I'll kind of end up with something like that and you can see on this side because this side is mirrored on that side it's automatically applied it to this side so I don't have to do it multiple times I can just do it on the one side and it will then mirror it over here until I apply this so that's that one done and then what I want to do is I'm going to press A to deselect everything I'm going to come back here I'm going to select this edge and this edge so the inner and outer edges there and I'm going to do the same again just give it a bit of a bevel so it's not quite so flat edged in the corners here if if that's what you're going for a flat edge sort of setup then go with it but I want to have come some sort of a bevel beveled edge in here just give it a bit more of a a look and feel so I'm going to go again control B and I'm going to drag out um, now you don't want to kind of go too far just go out to a certain point and then I'm going to go up to 10 segments again on there and I'm going to left click to apply and if I come over to this side you can see it's applied exactly the same beveling over here as well and that's the beauty of the mirror modifier just saves you having to do so much more work um, and where possible I would rec highly recommend to use it so now I'm going to press A and deselect everything that's fine so now that I've got to this stage then I'm, I'm comfortable with what I've got at the moment I don't really need to do much more with that 
so I can actually apply this. Sorry, I need to go into object mode. Make sure you're in object mode before you apply any modifiers. So we'll apply it. Now when I go back into edit mode, you can see now this has been, all of the extra geometry has been created using that mirror modifier. But I've only had to actually do the edits to one side. So again, it just saves you a lot of time messing around there, I think. Okay, so what I want to do then is basically move on. But you can see possibly in here, this is not really, it's a bit, yeah, the faces aren't really very nice on here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to apply the smooth shading. And this will then make it all really weird. And you'll think, oh my God, what's going on here? There's a couple of different methods um, that you can apply here. Uh, one of them is a modifier, which is called the edge split modifier. I don't like using that modifier. If I can help it, I won't use it. Um, but there is another function which is in your data tab here, which is called auto smooth. So if you actually click on this, it will then smooth out all of the edges similar in a fashion to the way the edge split works and you can then change the angles that you want it to apply that auto smooth to. Um, this for me is a much better way of doing it because it doesn't create any extra topology or extra geometry. Whereas if you use the edge split modifier, it actually, in my understanding, creates more geometry, which then is going to give you more vertices, more triangles and so on and so on and so on. Um, so you don't really want to do that if you can help it, but there are instances when that is required. Otherwise, the shading won't work properly and your textures will look really rubbish once you get it into a different engine. And that's what we're really where it all kind of falls apart sometimes, because um, in, in the Blender render engine, then everything can look fantastic and really, really nice. You stick it into a different game, into a different engine, more so a game engine other than most others with the different lighting and shading and whatever else that game engines tend to use, things can start to then really look bad and they can start to get messed up. Um, so yeah, just be a little bit careful again with that. You might get it into the, uh, into the map or whatever, and it will look really weird. You might then need to come back into Blender, apply the edge split modifier and do your export again. And that should fix it in the, for most parts at least, or in most circumstances. So now that we've got to this stage, then I think that looks much, much better. It's got a nice smooth edge to it. It's not so jaggedy. Um, and we've got our nice smooth bevel bevels at the back here and whatever else. <clears throat> um, you know, you could, you know, start to then go a little bit further and, you know, build maybe, uh, some sort of, a, you know, um, frame around the outside or whatever else. We're not going to do that in this particular scenario. It's just going to take too much time. I just wanted to give you an idea of what you can do in Blender here. But for the most part, what I want to show you is um, how to get the, the clamp actually working in Giants Editor. But I really wanted to show you this in Blender as well, because um, sometimes, you know, it's it's really important to understand, I think, how things work with the placeable system and uh, the importance of where to put your origin and things like that. If you don't put it in the right places, it will start to really mess things up with the placeable system. So I just wanted to show you this so you could possibly get an understanding of how um, how those things work, the uh, you know mechanics behind it sort of thing. Okay, so what we want to do now then is I'm just going to double check my scaling and rotation, which is all a zero. That's fantastic. So what I'm going to do then is back into edit mode. So I'm hit tab on the keyboard back into edit mode. Again, you can select that from the drop down here, but I find the shortcut keys much easier. I'm going to press A a couple of times just to make sure everything is selected. And then I'm going to open up another window. So I'm going to just in this top corner here, I'm going to click with my left mouse button and then drag out, which will create my new window. And then down here, I'm going to go to the 3D view or the view tab, which will be whatever window you want to bring up in here. So I'm just going to click on this one and I want to go to <clears throat> the UV image editor. At the moment, obviously there's nothing showing up in here because I haven't created a, an unwrap for it yet. So what I do want to do in, in this window, and again, this is one of the things that's really important. Make sure that your cursor 
is in the correct window for what you want to do. So I'm working with this at the moment because this is the window I want to do my unwrap. So I need my cursor to be over here. So I'm going to press U and I'm going to just use the smart UV project. So I'm going to click on that one. Uh, you can do a lot of different things in here. Um, I've actually, I used to do on island margin 0.1 and then area weight was 0 0.03. But, uh, you know, I just find it not really that relevant anymore. Um, in some cases, not something like this. It's fairly straightforward and basic. Uh, if you're working with something that's a lot more detailed, um, and there's a lot more geometry involved, then these parts here can be a little bit more important. Uh, but then there are circumstances where you would actually never use the smart UV project anyway, and you would mark your own seams. If it's got a lot more geometry and topology to it, then it would need, need its own seams marked and whatever else. Pop-ups. hate pop-ups. Um, anyway, so what I want to do then is I'm just going to do an island margin here of 0.1. That'll do. Um, and I won't worry about the area weight in this particular case, not really relevant. So we're just going to click OK and we get something like this. Doesn't really matter what that is, to be honest with you, in this particular case, because the whole thing is just going to be using one one texture um, as the, the diffuse or albedo or whatever you want to call it to cover the whole thing. If you're working with multiple textures in multiple parts, then this would need to be a lot cleaner. But for this, it's not really relevant. Um, so now that I've got that, I need to apply a material to the actual model itself because you can't apply a texture to something without a material. So it needs a material as like the primer, if you like, and then you're going to put the top coat on, which is your texture for lack of better way of explaining it. So I'm going to go to the material tab here in the um, window over here and I click new, but you'll see automatically it's then given it some shading because it's now got a material applied to it which is white you can turn that off which sometimes can help so if you come down here you've got shadeless so if i click on that it will then make it a shadeless material which can be a, a nice way of checking your textures because as you move your model around when you're checking your textures if it's got the shadeless unticked you'll have like um, dark and light spots all over it and it will then make it much diff much more difficult to actually um, see the texture in certain areas. But you want to work with um, shading to give you a better understanding again of how that's going to work once you export it out and put it into an i3D and things like that. So you can untick this and tick it as you need to um, to work out what it's going to look like in certain scenarios. Okay, so what I want to do then is now I've got my material. I'm going to rename this. I wouldn't recommend to just leave it at material 001. Give it a proper name. This is more important when you're working with lots of different um, objects all joined together. Uh, and you will then have to have like maybe a massive great long list of different materials for different things. Um, and if you don't name them, when it gets into Giants Editor and you then start looking, at th looking through them to apply the different textures, and all you can see is material 001, material 002, and so on and so on, It'll you won't know which part is which. So I'd recommend to just name these. Again, for this, not really relevant, but uh, it's good practice. So I'm just going to call this silage lamp underscore matte, as in material. And that's fair enough, that's good enough for me. So now that we've got that, I'm going to go over to the textures tab here, click new, and then if this is on anything else other than image or movie, make sure you click on here and actually select this. It could be on pretty much any one of these, uh, but I think by default now it tends to go to image and movie or image or movie, uh, but it, it might not necessarily be. So just make sure you select it. So it's image or movie. I'm going to come down to open. I'm going to go to my desktop here and I want to go into the folder that I've already put together with my textures I'm going to use. So I've got clamp underscore diffuse, clamp underscore normal, and clamp underscore specular. The only one I'm going to apply in Blender is the diffuse. The others I'm going to apply within in Giants Editor. So I'm going to double click on the diffuse, and that will then bring it in. You can see it here. If you want to, you can then bring it in to this window. There's no need to open it and apply it again because it's already been brought into Blender through this method. 
you just need to click on the selector here, the browser image to be linked, and then just click there and it will bring it in like so. Um, this can be beneficial when you're actually scaling the UV to the image because you can see the image in the background. But again, it's not necessarily required because if I now go over to my window here, my 3D view, go back into object mode, shift A, and I'm going to add in a hemi just so I can see what's going on. And I'm going to switch over to material and you'll see the actual texture apply over here. You can also do it under textured. So material or textured doesn't really matter um, in my opinion, but uh, I just use material. You can use either. But if I hide the light um, and take off the rendering, you can see it's all black. So you need a light in there to be able to actually see what's going on. And you can then zoom in and do whatever else. Uh, and this again may not be required. Um, if I select it again, tab back into edit mode. If that is good enough for you, then fantastic, go with it. But I like to come over to here and select everything again with A. So you might need to press A a couple of times, make sure everything's selected. And I'm just going to go S to scale. And I'm going to hit two on my numpad, which will scale it out by two on the X and the Z. Um, and I'm just going to left click. Now, one word of warning again here, you can only scale the UV to a certain point. I think the maximum you can go to is eight. And this is a cumulative, a cumulative. So um, if you do like, for example, if I go control Z here, if I go scale eight and then press enter, it will give me this. OK, and that's the maximum I could go to. But let's just say, for example, I went S and two. Now, the only scaling that I've got left is six because I've used two of the six up, if that makes sense. I've played around with this quite considerably in the past and I could be completely wrong, but uh, when I've tried to do this before and I've had a texture on something, I've scaled it by a certain amount and I've scaled it again and I've scaled it again and I've scaled it again and then I've exported it out, brought it into Giants Editor and it gives me an error um, and it says, I forget what it is now, but something to do with scaling is above the maximum eight by eight or something like that. So that gives me an indication that eight is the maximum you can go to. Uh, it might sound simple, but uh, um, it, you can get quite confused. It can get quite confusing because you can scale it by two, for example. But now if I press S in the bottom here, you can see just down here, it starts at one again. So I would then go, oh, I've got eight again. So I can just go eight. Fantastic. Uh, but now you've actually scaled it by 10 because you've already applied a scale of two to it in the first place. So just be a little bit careful with that. It, it, it can catch you out. It certainly has caught me out more than more than once. So again, I'm going to just go scale and I'm just going to do two or I might do four. Maybe let's do four. That's fine. And then that will apply the scaling to the um, unit over here, the mesh. Um, and that's really all there is to that. So, OK, so now that we've done that, I'm going to close that down. And I think that looks OK. That's not too bad. It's pretty basic, but that's really all I wanted to do here is just basic. So that's that. Um, and that's pretty much what we need to do in um, Blender here. Again, just make sure your scale rotation is all at zero and your location for this particular case is at zero. <clears throat> OK, so that's fine. Um, so what I'm going to do now then is go back into solid mode and I'm going to delete the Hemi. So don't need that anymore. And then this will be exported out. So what I'm going to do now then is I'm going to rename the cube here. So I'm just going to rename this to silage clamp like so. Then we can export it out. So I've got the i3D exporter plugin in, in Blender here. But you, you could always export this out as FBX because the Giants Editor does actually accept FBX as an imported um, extension. So you could do it that way if you didn't want to work with the I3D exporter. But I'm going to just use that because it's just easier. So we're just going to go File, Export, and then choose Giants I3D. Go to the desktop, find the appropriate folder. So I've got Silage Clamp. I'm going to put it in there. And again, we'll just call this size clamp for the sake of ease. And then we'll just do like that. And I'm going to hit enter and it'll give it the correct extension of I3D. 
and I'm just going to go export. Pretty straightforward. Um, what I will do is actually save it as well. So I'm just going to go save. We'll go back into the same folder here. And I'm just going to call this size clamp as well, just so that um, I can close down Blender, but I've got that saved that if I need to make any changes, I can come back in and do so. Because far too many times I've got to this point and then close down Blender and not save the blend file or not save my work. And I've opened up the i3D. It looks stupid. It looks a complete mess. I've had to rebuild the whole thing from scratch. So it's always worth saving your project in Blender somewhere that you can always go back to it and make any changes that you need to. But now I can close that down. That's fine. So if I go into here, we have our blend file so I can go back into Blender if I need to make any changes. And I have my i3D. So before you actually open the i3D in Giant Editor, I would recommend that you right click it or whatever you choose to do with your text editor. I use Notepad++. We're going to go into here and you can see that the actual file name that it's that's blend that Blender has given it is just a mess. I, the, the Giant's i3D won't understand what this is. Uh, so I'm going to just basically delete all that dot dot slash stuff and whatever else because that's not really relevant in this case. So we just have the actual file name which points to my diffuse because they're all in the same folder. It's just here. If I were to put all of these in another folder called textures, then it would be <coughs> textures forward slash clamp underscore diffuse. But this is fine. Go ahead and save it. Close that down. Um, unfortunately, the i3d exporter for blender is not very it's not like a full-fledged version like the people that have maya or maya or however you pronounce that um so we don't get a lot of functions unfortunately that uh that that program has and one of the things it doesn't do is it doesn't create our shapes file file for us when we export it out so we need to create that using the giant editor it's pretty straightforward, but it is annoying that it doesn't give us that automatically using the i3D exporter. But uh, again, it is what it is, so we just have to go with it if you're going to be using Blender. So I'm going to double click this, open it up in the giant editor. And we have this. And you can see in the console it says, Warning, i3D contains, non contains non-binary index triangle sets. So before you go any further, you just basically need to save this out. So I'm just going to go file save as. I'm going to select my i3D and then in the save as type you need to select binary i3D and then click save. It'll ask if you want to replace it, which you're replacing this. Well, I say yes and then we close it down. It's better to do that right at the beginning. Um, instead of making loads and loads of changes and then saving it later and then having to scrap the whole project for whatever reason so it's all i think in my opinion it's always best to just do this get it out of the way right at the beginning create your shapes file then you can go back in make any changes you need to make and that part is already done for you don't have to worry about it later on okay so if we have a look at this now then we can see that my texture my diffuse or albedo texture is applied but it's got all this you know really shiny shiny stuff to it because with the new material system in FS19, it uses um, a different setup. So we have like this, if I open up the material editing window, we have this smoothness and metalness kind of setup. Um, <clears throat> now quick and easy, you could just change those to zero and that would then get rid of that. So if I just change these to zero and zero, there we go, it's gone. If I then go control L and bring in a lamp, you can see it's all just flat, nothing to it. But there are times when you want something a little bit, you know, it wants to be a little bit shiny or a little bit whatever. Uh, and that's where a gloss map comes in or a specular. It's called a gloss map, but it would be a specular. So we can do that instead. So if, for example, I put both of these back to one and one and then apply a gloss map, these will automatically be cancelled out and not required. If you're struggling to find a gloss map, um, then there is one you can use, which is the default specular. So just click on the thing here and it crashes Giant's editor. Fantastic. <clears throat> Probably because I've messed about with the sliders too much. We'll do that again if I open up the material editing window here. So I can click on this one and then it'll bring up my search bar here or search window. 
I've got a specular I can use, but if you don't have one, you can go into your installation folder or farm sim 2019. I use this quite regular for various different reasons. And in here in your data shared folder, you have some de default uh, textures and you have this default specular here. So if I apply that one, it will give us this effect, which might be exactly what you're looking for. So it's always worth keeping that one in mind and it automatically cancels out the smoothness and metalness, like I said. But I don't want to use that one, I've got my own, so I'm just going to basically go into the desktop here, go into my folder size clamp, and I'm just going to use this one, which has a little bit more effect to it, so we'll use that instead, like so. And I'm going to apply the normal map, like so. And I think that's pretty much, you know, where we need to be with that. I don't think there's anything further that needs to be done there. Now there is, or there are some different ways that you can do, do this in Blender. I would possibly create a second UV and then I would be able to use the building shader um, or something like that and then apply, you know, different um, moss and dirt effects. This is a silage clamp, you know, <laughs> it's not nothing fancy. If I wanted to really get excitable about this and have kind of moss and dirt effects, I would just make decals, um, just create decals in Blender with different uh, transparency textures to do with you know moss and dirt and apply them where I wanted to. Um, and that way you get kind of more control over what you want to get out of it because you can place the decals where you want them to be and creating moss and dirt effects uh, in separate specular channels or set separate specular maps is a right ball ache in my opinion. So uh, decals can be, you know, your friend in that case. But to me, this is good enough. The texture I've chosen does have kind of like a moss and dirt effect to it anyway. So, you know, I'm just going to stick with that and not mess around with shaders. They're not that important in my opinion. Um, <clears throat> so we don't gonna, we're not going to worry about custom shaders. I've just got nothing in there and whatever else. So that's fine. Okay. Uh, so now that we've actually got all of those set up, I can close that one down. So I want to make it a rigid body object. And if I come over to the rigid body section here, I'm going to change my collision mask. At the moment, it's just FF, which means that tractors and other equipment and your character won't be able to walk through it and things like that. But for a solid clamp, you need to add an extra one so that theoretically the product that's going to be tipped in here won't leak through the walls. It doesn't work, in my opinion. It's a bit broken, but uh, I would recommend that you do it anyway. So you need to have all of these selected, 0 to 9, and then also 19, which will give you this result. And that's meant to actually stop things bleeding through the walls. But again, like I said, it's a little bit broken, in my opinion. It doesn't work very well, uh, but it's you know good idea to do it anyway. So what we also want to do here is apply a user attribute to our clamp. But what I'm going to do is, instead of doing that right now, I'm going to do it in a little while because I want to show you how the um, default one is set up. So now I've got to this part, I'm going to close that down and we'll do like so. I'll move that one out of the way. And then what I'm going to do is actually make or, or create a mod from game, uh, a size clamp that you would find in game to get all of the necessary parts created for me. Um, so I'm going to open up Giant Senator again in a separate blank session here. File, new mod from game. Just going to grab a drink. From the drop down, somewhere right down the bottom here, we've got some different bunker silos. Choose which whatever one is appropriate for the size of clamp that you're going to be working with. It's not really that relevant, but uh, if it's a single clamp, then obviously go with the single ones. If it's a double one you're creating, then go with the doubles. Um, or if you're making triples or quadruples or whatever else, you might want to use the doubles. Just gives you more triggers and things like that. And it could can then guide you on how to set up the different XMLs. Um, <clears throat> but I'm just got a single, so I'm just going to go bunker silo medium. That's perfectly fine. I'm going to go OK. We'll do like so, and it's going to give me this. 
So I'll save that and I'm going to close that down. I'm just going to go into the folder that it put it into. So we'll drag that out onto the desktop like so. <clears throat> so go back into my size clamp here and I'm just going to take all of that stuff, control X and put it into there like so. <clears throat> so if I open up this one again in um, Giant Senator, and I'm going to go File, Import, and I'm going to bring in the standard base game one. And as you can see there, because I rotated the object in Blender, because I didn't feel it was the right way around, I was right in doing that. I wasn't too sure, to be honest with you. But it's really important that you get that set correctly, because if it's going across this way, you will have to rotate things, and then that will start messing with your attributes. And you want to really keep everything at zero. Now you can rotate things and then use the freeze transformation, uh, but sometimes that can mess things up even more in my you know my experience so far. So I wouldn't do that if you can help it. So what I want to do here though is I've got my size clamp and I want to take all of the stuff that's contained in the giant's original one here and take all of that. So I'm going to highlight it, control X, and I'm going to click on my size clamp. Control V. Before I delete this one, if I go into Window and then <clears throat> User Attributes, you can see here it has a user attribute of Collision Height underscore. Uh, sorry, Collision Height, and it has a uh, a value of four. If I minimise that and I go into the i3D in Notepad plus plus, we scroll down to the bottom. You can see the user attributes here. Of collision height with a type of float and then a value of four so this can be quite handy to do this because I can just double click the name and take it directly from there that way I know I'm spell spelling it correctly so I can take that from there come into my size clamp and paste that into there and the type was a float so I can do like so and then apply that and in my case I'm going to go 10 because my walls are a little bit higher so I want to make them, you know, that collision height, the uh, right setting for my walls. And if we actually look at the original one here, go to this one, <clears throat> you can see there that the actual origin is set at the base of the clamp, not in the middle um, or off to the side. So again, that's something that's really important when you're working with anything in Blender to set your origin in the correct place more so when you're working with placeables if you're going to create something as a placeable mod it's very important to get that origin in the right place um, or set up correctly i can delete that one now don't need it anymore so next thing we want to do then is actually create our interactive trigger or set up our interactive trigger in the right place at the moment we can't see it so again in our attributes window we're going to come over to a visibility and put a tick in the box and then we can see it for the most part, if you really want to have, you know, a good, um, you want to be able to see it really clearly, you can come over to shape and then click non-renderable. And then you'll actually be able to see it with its correct shading on it and whatever else in the material, uh, which is a Lambert one. But it's not really that relevant, but uh, sometimes it can be helpful. So now what I'm going to do is just basically scale this down to, you know, a, an appropriate size to fit into the bunker here. It doesn't really matter that much, to be honest with you. You don't want it to be, you know, too big. This is an interactive trigger. This is the trigger that you're, you will walk into to get your information on how much chaff um, is in the bunker and also um, what stage of fermenting it's in and all that sort of stuff. So you don't want it to be poking out or I would, again, in my opinion, say you don't want to be poking out like all over the place. You want to be able to walk or you want to have it set up where you actually physically have to walk into the clamp to get that information. So I always tend to make it a little bit smaller uh, than the clamp itself. So if I come back a little bit more, maybe we'll just go out sort of to the wall. Um, so let's just do, no, it's not going to let me do that. So let's do 0.65 for three, two. Right, there we go, something like that will be fine. That's good enough. 
Um, and then I'm just going to make it a bit wider. So we'll grab onto this one here and just make it a bit wider. And then I'm just going to do something like that. That'll be perfect, perfectly fine. And again, because of the origin um, on this particular trigger or this mesh object, whatever you want to call it, I can scale the X in a similar fashion and just drag down like so. Origin is very important. <clears throat> right, so now we've got that set up, I would basically be able to walk into this trigger and it will give me the information that I need. And that's really uh, um, why I do it the way I do it, by creating a mod from game, because everything is already set up for me. I don't have to worry about what collision mask this trigger is, is going to need. Um, or whatever else, uh, it's already been done for me, so I don't need to worry about stuff like that. Uh, now, what I would do is, now that you've actually made your trigger the right size, you've scaled it to whatever you need to scale it to, um, as long as your clamp or whatever object that you've got the child set up in, because this is the hierarchy, so your clamp is the, is the parent and everything else inside is the child, so as long as the parent is scaled at 1, 1, and 1, you should be good to go, and I can rescale this. So because of this, this is all a bit of a jumble, the scaling. So I'm going to actually go edit, freeze transformation, untick translate, click scale and apply. And now my scaling has been set to one, one and one for this trigger. And that's, that's something again, I would probably recommend that's done. Uh, so the next thing we want to work with then is the actual bunker silo area itself. This will be the area that the magic works where your chaff is converted into silage. Um, so we have various different nodes. So we've got a start, <clears throat> width, and height. But at the moment, there's no way to kind of judge where they're going to be placed because it's just an empty world that we're working in. So again, what I would probably recommend to do here is create a primitive plane, which is going to again spawn in the middle here. And then just make it big enough to work with. So something like that will be perfectly fine. And now this gives me something to base everything around. So I can go back to the start node here, come into the corner here, control B, and I can then click somewhere like so, and that will be my start position. <clears throat> then what I can do is take a copy of the translate XYZ by holding left shift and left control and then pressing C. As long as I've got my cursor in one of these, it'll copy all three of them. I can go to width, left shift, left control and V and it'll put it all into there. And then that keeps everything in the right position because you want to keep this really at zero. So I can now literally just take this one, the width node, and drag it into the appropriate place that I want it to be. So I can just drag it across to somewhere. Slow my nav speed down a little bit. Something like that. And I can then just drag this one over to the corner like so. <clears throat> I think that will be perfectly fine there. So now I can go to the height and I'll do the same again. So I'm going to paste in the start information because it goes start, width, and then height. So height is on the same axis um, as the start position. And I can just drag it backwards. So really straightforward. So we'll just go back to somewhere like that. You may need to have a bit of a play around with those um, if you have issues in game. Uh, but uh, for the most part, I've never not come across any massive issues. So we should be good to go there. Um, now the clear areas and leveling areas, they are primarily for the actual in-game purchased placeable. If you're setting up a solid clamp that's going to be loaded into the map through the default items XML, they are not relevant and you can delete them. Um, but if you do delete them, make sure that you also delete the relevant uh, parts in the XML because otherwise the XML will be looking for these, it won't find them and it will give you errors. So just be a little bit careful with that. Okay, so 
we've got that part set up. If you wanted to do the, the uh, clear areas and whatever else, again, I would recommend using um, a primitive object like a plane and then working out how much of an area that you want to delete or um, replace around the clamp itself. <clears throat> so kind of like judge it and, you know, um, against the plane itself. So maybe I want to go to something like that. So I might want to be maybe 22, something like that. And then I do the other way. So maybe something like that, that will probably work. Um, again, one of these sorts of things where you might need to have a bit of a, a mess around with it. You might need to go in the game, test it out um, and then adjust it accordingly. Uh, the leveling stuff is a little bit broken in my opinion, um, or the terraforming setup where it creates massive great like ridges when it puts it in and you then can't access what you've just placed and you have to then sell it and try and replace it again. Um, now obviously there is the terraforming tool in game, but again, that is something that I believe is also broken in my opinion. Um, and once you've placed something down and you then try and terraform the terrain to smooth it out, it says this terrain cannot be terraformed in this area because it's colliding with the setup of the placeable um, and it's collisions against collisions against collisions and they just won't let you work. So uh, it's better to set, set up your placeable um, as best you can when it comes to terraforming in the leveling area at the beginning so that uh, it saves a lot of hassle later on. But again, there are pros and cons to everything because if I set my leveling area up too big, um, I would also then need to set up the tip collision to that size and or tip occlusion and various other different things. Placeable areas would have to be that size. And then you'll probably come across problems where the only place that you can actually put the um, placeable down will be in a really big open field because it won't fit anywhere else on the map. So um, there's a lot of sort of backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards, changing attributes and changing various different things to get everything to work 100%. Well, I don't think it'll ever be 100%, but there it is. So let's do this one then. So again, like I did before, if we have a look at these before we move them. So we've got start width and height so start width height <clears throat> so again i'm going to do this one here and i want it to clear the area over to somewhere here it doesn't have to be perfect so somewhere over here will do like that that's fine good enough for this anyway at least <clears throat> so again what i'm going to do is copy the attributes translate x y and z from here go to my width and paste them into there like so. And then I can just take this one and drag it over to the side, something like that. <clears throat> now, if you look at um, like your width here, you're moving this on the translate X. So if you look at this one and take this reading here, <clears throat> apply it to your width, and then basically put a negative, it will be exact opposite of where this one is. So that's, you know, Maybe another tip there, easy, cheap way of doing it if you want it to be some sort of, um, you know, symmetrical, whatever, mirrored, whatever. <laughs> um, yeah, something anyway. So we're going to do the same with this one then. Let's take these readings from here and we'll then go to the height and we'll put those into there. And I can just basically do the same again with this one and because obviously this is a lot longer than this is wider um, the other way won't work quite so well so we'll just go back to somewhere like that because if i do let's do this one well, it might do let's try it let's do translate z and put that into there and then put a negative yeah that works we'll go with that so there you go <clears throat> nice and easy and then your leveling areas would be very similar. So if you wanted to here, you could literally just take the readings from these and apply them to these. Uh, that's probably what I would do. Um, so I'll just take all of those and just put them into there. So they match the same. 
Um, that one. That one. And that one. There we go. Something like that. So now that's pretty much good to go. So we can. Um, actually, I won't delete the plane just yet because I'm going to need that in a minute. Um, so we'll save where we are at the moment. That's pretty much good to go there. And the next thing we want to look at is the XMLs. I'm going to close that down for now. And we'll close that down because we don't need that anymore. Um, and I can actually delete those because that's not relevant. So I'll get rid of those. As long as I keep my silos clamp, I'll just double check that that's still good to go. Yep. Okay, so let's do mod desk. There's so much to do. So put my name in, you put yours, or you can put mine if you want, but I would recommend you put yours. Um, and we're just going to change that to 1.0. That's good enough. Um, your icon will be like um, your preview in your mod list when you go in the game, or if you're going to put it on the mod hub or whatever else. I'm not sure if it uses the icon, could be wrong. Uh, but anyway, in the mod list, when you go in the game, the icon is displayed there to show you like a preview of what mod it is or whatever else. We'll get to that in a minute, because we need to create a, an image for that. So we'll just make a few spaces here. Um, unfortunately, and I don't know why, when you create a new mod from game, um, it gives you the mod desk, but it doesn't give you all the information because there's no multiplayer supported equals true, no title, no description. Um, let's just say, for example, the multiplayer, multiplayer supported equals true. You know, not every mod would be possibly for multiplayer purposes. So I can understand that one, but it would be nice to have the title and description tags put in here with maybe the minimum translation tags, sort of like EN, DR, uh, DE and FR. Uh, with just some sample text in there, just to give you an indication of what needs to be there. Because if you don't put a title and description in, the mod will not load into game. It will give you an error and it will say that there's um, the title and description are missing or something like that. So why it's left out, I don't know, but uh, it is. So it's something you need to add in. So first of all, we're going to put in the multiplayer, but we need to put a... I call these carrots, but it might be called something different. So we need to put an open carrot and then multiplayer. <clears throat> and then space supported equals quote true quote space slash forward slash n carrot. <clears throat> okay, so that's that one set up. So we're going to go down, open carrot, whatever the hell that might be called, I don't know, but that's what I'm calling it again. Title, close carrot, and then we're going to do open carrot, en, close carrot, um, and then I'm just going to put in a really simple description here. So this will just be, um, well, you can call it whatever you want, just call it custom. Let's call it custom clamp. That'll do. Then we want to go open carrot forward slash E N close carrot. Then we're going to come down to here. Open carrot title close carrot. But we need to put in here the forward slash. So it's going to be open carrot forward slash. And then I've spelt title wrong. So we need to do <clears throat> that. And that will close it off. Um, and then we can come down again. So make another space here. We're going to do open carrot description. Close carrot. We're going to do open carrot en. Close carrot. And then we're just going to do again custom clamp for production of silage. You can put what you want, ferment, ferment, fermenting of silage or fermenting of chaff or, but you know, whatever, that's good enough for me. So we'll do 
open carrot slash en close carrot. Then we come down, we need to close that section off. So open carrot slash description close carrot. Okay. And then we'll just close that up, tidy it up a little bit. And that's pretty much that. Um, if you're going to get into other things, then you'll need L10 ends and things like that. But that should be more than enough for what we're going to do here. So we'll go ahead and save that. It's already got the store item with the XML and whatever else in there. So that's fine. Um, so let's close that down for now. Um, so let's do. Let's do, let's do. I'm going to change the name of. Do I need to change the name? No, I'm not going to change the name of that. That's not really relevant. Don't need to change the name of that. So let's um, open this. What I'm going to do there is take the name of my i3D, make a copy of that, and I'm going to come into here and change the file name here to my i3D so it loads mine in. Everything else there pretty much I can leave as it is. Um, this one I'm also going to, going to need to change that. Then what you need to do is look through all of your different parts down here um, to make sure that they're all set up correctly. So let's just separate these out a little bit so we can see them a bit easier. Something like that. So your placement <clears throat> is going to be the area that is set for the place placeable um, so that you can't basically put it up against other objects. But I wouldn't recommend to make this, you know, silly because it will break it. Um, you'll have objects colliding into other objects. So be somewhat realistic about what numbers you're going to put into here. So all we need to do is then open up the I3D here again in Giant Serta. And what I'm going to use is the plane and the actual scaling here is what I'm going to apply to the XML. So we have X at 22. So what I want to do here is in the X here, I'm going to go 22. And then in the Z, we've got 29. So I'm going to put 29 in there. And then the actual, I'm going to go up by one. So I'm going to go 23 and 30. Okay. And then these ones down here, I can just use the 22 and for the tip occlusion update area. So we're just going to go 22 on the X and 29 on the Z. <clears throat> Everything else there you can pretty much leave as it is. Uh, the bunker silos. So we've got our fill types of chaff, grass, windrow, dry grass, windrow, whatever, whatever you want in there to be accepted. So if you're working with um, alfalfa, you could put alfalfa windrow or whatever the fill type name is for that. So you could then use your alfalfa to create your silage in your silage clamps. Your input fill type will be chaff. So whatever you put in there will be converted to chaff automatically. And then your output is going to be silage. So you can mess about with those and you know get some weird and wacky things coming out of your silage clamps. Um, but then we need to just basically have a look through our nodes. So if we look here for our bunker silo, and just match all of these up. So go back into here. Bunker silo area is going to be one zero. So if we go into here, we have one zero. And then the others are going to be one one and one two. So we have one one and one two. So those are good. And then the other ones are going to be interactive trigger node is zero. So if we go back to here, our interactive trigger, which I'm actually going to take off the visibility is zero, the, the last number here on the index path. So that's zero. So that matches up perfectly fine. Clear areas, start node, width node and height node. So two zero, two one and two two. So if we go back into here and look under our clear areas, we have two zero, two one and two two. Fantastic. So all of those match up. There's no reason why they wouldn't because I haven't changed anything, but it's always worth checking. So then our leveling area, three zero, three one, three two. So if we close that one down and we have three zero, three one and three two. Fantastic. So all of those are pretty much good to go. So I'm going to delete the plane because I no longer require that to be in here. It's served it per 
served its purpose. So go ahead and save that, close that down. And then your ground type, you can change that to whatever you want to change. So you can put grass or um, asphalt or whatever you choose to put in there for your ground type. I'm just going to leave it at concrete. That's perfectly fine. And we can go ahead and save that for now. Um, so uh, I shouldn't have closed that down because I'm going to need it again. So let's open this up again. And what I want to do is just take a, a, a picture, an image um, of this in here, just so I can kind of, you know, use that. So maybe add a light, something like that, maybe. Um, I don't know. It's a bit tricky sometimes to get the camera where you want it to be to give you a good kind of angle, but uh, maybe something like that. Let's try that. So I use snipping tool, which is part of Windows. So we'll just do something like that. The save, put it on my desktop. Uh, let's minimize that for now. So let's open this up in paint.net. And we'll clean it up a little bit. So we'll just do something like that image crop to selection. Um, this has to be power of two. So however the image is going to look, uh, this is going to probably look really broken, but uh, that's fine. Doesn't really matter for this. So we've got something like that. And then I'm going to use the magic wand if it will let me. Sometimes again, this can be really tricky to get right. It might not work because you want to delete the out part, the outer part really. So it's got a transparency to it, an alpha to it. It can be a little bit of a pain sometimes to actually get it where you want it to be. Um, which then sometimes you might need to make a different picture because uh, that one's not going to work. So you then need to come back into here and rotate your camera around a little bit more and do it again, sort of thing, something like this, maybe. We'll do something like that. Get rid of that. Something like that. So we'll do it again. And save. Can take a couple of attempts sometimes to get the image that you actually want. So let's open this. Let's try the magic one first of all. No, that's still not going to work. Okay, let's do um, instead of that, then let's get rid of the light because the light might be causing some problems. Can sometimes cause some issues. So let's go back into this position here then. Uh, snipping tool. Let's do maybe that. Save. <clears throat> There we go. It was the light causing me some issues. Okay, so what we want to do then is let's do um, rectangle and just crop this a little bit. So maybe something like that image crop to selection. Um, and then I'm just going to go file resize 512 by 512. Something like that. It's not the greatest, but it you know it's good enough. Um, you could add some more to it if you wanted to. Uh, make sure that you save these correctly in the correct format. So what I would do is make sure or go into um, you know the installation folder here, find one of the original store images, and then use a program called WTV. Whoops, didn't want that. Uh, WTV, which will look at formats of DDS files, and then you can just drag that in, and it's a DXT5 no mipmap. So that gives you a good idea of what to actually save it out as. So um, don't need that anymore. Let's close that, open this up. So we're going to go file, save as, um, and then we'll just call this uh, store underscore Silage so 
clamp. There we go. And then we'll just do DDS, save, DXT5, no MIP app. OK. Close that down. And then I can go back into gear, put that into there, get rid of that. And then we'll take the text from there. And we can put that into our mod desk for our icon. So we'll put that into there. And we'll also go into here and put that into there like so. And save. And then you can rename whatever you want to uh, you know your liking. So in here for the name, I would just possibly do custom solidage clamp. Again, you know, <clears throat> whatever you choose to call it and put in there is up to you. So let's do that. And we now have a mod, um, pretty much. So <clears throat> if everything is set up as it needs to be set up there, we should be able to go in the game, purchase it for whatever cost I've set it to or whatever cost it was set to in the XML here. So um, 25,000. Again, you can change all of that stuff to whatever you choose to. So uh, I will actually let's get rid of that one and let's take that out of there. We don't want that in there. So um, let's see. Uh, let's do this, this, this. And I don't want it to be on that one. This is my Marwell. So we'll do like that and then I'll go new mods and we'll put that into there. Now, if you're going to play on a multiplayer server, this would need to be uh, zipped, but uh, for single player, it doesn't matter. What I will do before I actually go any further, I'm going to then put on the front of this FS19 underscore and then size clamp. <clears throat> like so. And that's pretty much, that's, yeah, that's pretty much what we've got to do. So uh, we've now got the mod in the mod folder. Um, if I go into game, uh, we'll just try it out on Felsbrun or, yeah, Felsbrun will do. Yeah. That should be fine. So we'll just go into here and we'll create a new new thingy. We'll do Felsbrun. And if we've got it working so far, we should have our custom clamp with the icon showing up here. Fantastic. We'll go start. And I'm going to have a, another drink, so let's excuse the uh, fizzy fizz. There we go. Okay, so here we are on Felsburn. Um <clears throat> I've just started a new farmer mode because I want to use this area here to place this down. So let's just do that. And we'll go into the store. Um, so, not quite sure. Yeah, there we go. So it's in the correct place. It's in under silos. <clears throat> so we have our store image, price, Build types, double click it, and there we go. So now I can rotate this around to my heart's content. Now it is set up to um, snap to angle or whatever it is, but that's fine, doesn't really matter. And we can then place it. <coughs> Whoops, and there we go. We have our clear areas, it's deleted the grass, it's put down the um, concrete, was it? Yeah, concrete. And we have our clamp in the map. If I then go into the clamp itself, press F1, fill level chaff zero, compacting zero. And if I had some, I would then put some grass or whatever else into here <clears throat> and it would then change, but I'm not going to do that. That's, you know, I'm confident that that would work without any issues. Now, obviously where I've put this is on relatively level ground. It may have terraformed areas, but uh, not too much because it's on pretty level ground. But let's just say, for example, if I uh, let's go into here, 
<clears throat> and do it like that. So I've just got a bit more money. If I was to put this, let's say, on maybe some uneven ground. So we'll come over to here and uh, maybe rotate it around that way and then do like that. You can see that it's terraformed the terrain behind it. So it's brought this up and then I can still access it from this side though. And it gives me my fill level chaff zero compacting zero. So pretty much that's how you would set up um, a custom silage clamp um, from Blender into working in the game. And that's my today's whatever you want to call this. <clears throat> Thanks very much for watching. I'm Shell Wizard. I'll catch you on the next one.